Her Sports Six Nation Show in association with Opal. Hello and welcome to the new Her Sports Six Nation Show brought to you in association with Opal, the exclusive car partner to the IRFU. You can catch up on this episode and every episode in the series on YouTube and our social channels or listen to the podcast on every podcast app. I'm joined here in studio by the lovely Hannah Tyrrell. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, good. Looking forward to this. So, Hannah, this Six Nations, it's come to us a whole new era of women's rugby in Ireland. What do you think it's going to bring for us? Yeah, look, I think it's a, a fresh start for us. Um, you know, there's been a lot of change in personnel. Um, with the review having come out as well, I just think it's a, an opportunity for us to start rebuilding and and put women's rugby in Ireland on the map and, and set us on a, a new route uh, towards you know the next World Cup and, and start building some squad depth and um, hopefully get some good results. Mm -hmm. And we have a new coach in there, Greg McWilliams. What do you think he's going to bring to the team? Yeah, so to be honest, I don't know too much about Greg McWilliams myself. When I joined the squad, he was part of the previous group of management and he had left by then. But you know, from what I've heard from past players, He's very well respected, you know, and um, he brings his own kind of identity to it. And he's going to try shape his squad over the next few weeks. And we've seen that already with some selection picks, how he kind of likes to do things. But I think he's just trying to put Irish rugby back in a really good place, you know, get the squad performing, get them confident. And hopefully with that, it comes a few results. But I definitely know that he's going to start building for the future. And, and again, looking towards that, that World Cup. Mm -hmm. So his aim, I suppose, is to get caps on the board, build up those players so he has a team going forward rather than just for now for the Six Nations. Yeah, absolutely. Look, obviously he wants to get results this Six Nations, but I don't think that that's the, the biggest thing on his mind right now and the biggest priority for him. It is about building a squad, getting that depth in, giving players experience. You know, we've seen already with squad selection that he's picked a lot based off form, particularly with the, the AAL League just gone. Um, and he's given players opportunities to put up their hand and, and getting them in that kind of uh, Irish camp and, and that environment and seeing can they get up to speed with it. And, um, you know, we've nine new caps in the squad. Mm -hmm. That shows he's willing to explore all his options and, and he is looking to the future. There's a lot of young players in there. So I'm really looking forward to seeing kind of how he wants to play the game and how he's going to put his own um, tact and ideas on the board and, and how that plays out for the girls starting this weekend. Mm -hmm. And were you surprised by anyone included in that 38 player squad? I was, I loved the fact that he did really pick on form. You know, there's a lot of players in there who have been capped before and then left out of more recent squads, um, you know, and that he felt like um, have played really well. The likes of Michelle Claffey back in the squad with Black Rock having, having missed a couple of campaigns. Um, Nikki Cahey, another one, he's given a chance at 10, which has been a difficult role for Ireland. But it is exciting to see some of those new squads, or new players in. Um, you know, I think personally, and she's been in already, she was captain the uh, November International, but I think Maeve O'Goleary is going to have a big campaign, or would hope to, because what I've seen of her in club has been excellent. But um, surprise, no, it, it is a very big squad. You need that, you know, you're going through five games. So um, I think it's a six, 36 player squad. Not all those will see game time in that but it gives them a chance to get in and see what the setup is like and you know hopefully there's a few of them that grab their opportunity and, and manage to get a jersey at the end of it. Mm -hmm. So before we get into obviously Nicola Friday being named the new Irish captain uh, we just have a competition for all our listeners so all this week we're giving you the chance to go and support the girls in green as they take on Wales in their opening match of the TikTok Six Nations Championship. You can win two tickets to Ireland's opening fixture at the RDS to enter, comment below what you think the final score will be in Ireland versus Wales match this Saturday and a winner will be picked at random. So, Nicola Friday, what do you think of her as captain? Yeah, I think it's a fairly solid choice from Greg. Uh, Nicola's been part of the squad now for a good number of years and, and particularly in the last couple of campaigns, she's kind of cemented her place in the second row. You know, captaincy does uh, tend to go to a forward player. They're more... Um, likely to be nearer to the ref and to be able to have their own say in that and kind of influence things from there and you know um she has cemented her place there in second row she is a solid player she's worked really really hard in her game over the last number of years but she has big boots to fill in um you know the departing Kira griffin but they have a great friendship and a great relationship and i'm sure that you know behind the scenes um junior's given her 
all the tips and tricks she needs to be able to be a good captain. But she's very well respected within the squad, you know. And I think there is um, a lot of opportunities for her to kind of stake her claim and lead this team. And it'll be a, a new challenge for her and a new role. But Greg obviously has a lot of faith in her. And, you know, I, I sincerely hope she's up to the challenge and that everything goes well for her this year. And for the captain of the team to have 22 caps under her belt, it's not a whole lot. What do you what do you make of that? Well, look, I don't think Greg had many opportunities to pick anyone more experienced. I think Emer Constein's the most capped player at 23 caps. So, you know, she is one of the most experienced in the team. She has been around a while, but um, it is a fairly young team in terms of experience as well as age. So... You know, Nicola would be, I think, about 26, 27 now. Sorry, Nicola, if you're a little younger. Um, but, you know, she's well able to lead them. She um, she is a line-out leader in there anyway and kind of, you know, shuffles the pack around and tells them what to do in that regard. So she should have no problem in that. But I really hope it doesn't take away from her game in any sort of way and that, you know, she doesn't lose focus of her role within the team on the pitch because of her duties off it. But... Um, yeah, look, it's a good choice from Greg and one he obviously has a lot of faith in and, and hopefully it goes well for the team. Mm -hmm. And with Nicola there in the pack kind of leading them, who do you expect to step up in the back line? You know, look, I think, again, um, there are not too many players with lots of 15s caps, but we do have a lot of players in the squad who have been around Irish rugby setups for a long time. You know, in that squad there, you have the likes of the sevens players, Stacey Flood, Emily murphy Crow, uh, Lucy Mulhall, who have been in the Irish 7 setup and in and out of the 15 setup for probably five or six years now. And so while they don't have a lot of 15s cap, they have an awful lot of experience. And I, I fully believe that they will have a huge um, role to play in, in this Six Nations campaign. Um, and, you know, they're very capable players and they're, they're very capable leaders in their own right, Lucy Mulhall being captain of the 7s. So it's probably... Those kind of players, Stacey Flood, Eve Higgins, Catherine Dane will have a, a huge um, say in how the team is run and how they play in tempo-wise at nine. So th there is a lot of leaders there, despite maybe experience in terms of age. Mm -hmm. And so at the press conference the other day, Greg McWilliams said he wasn't having a vice captain for the team. Instead, he has the leadership three, he called them. So Nicole Cronin, Catherine Dane and Hannah O'Connor. What do you make of that? Any surprising choices? In that squad... No, um, it is a bit unusual not to have a vice captain um, because it tells me that, you know, if... It's a lot of competing voices maybe for... No, but there's always leadership groups, you know, in the past number of years there have been leadership groups there uh, which, you know, is spread across the team. So in that leadership group there you have Hannah O'Connor who's a forward, you have um, Nicole Cronin who is a back and then Captain Dane who is a back but a scrum half. So she's kind of in the middle. So they have a full flow across the... Um, across the board and squad and they'll all have voices and be trying to get their point across with terms of things and, and they all have experience in many different ways. Nicole Cronin was in the squad a good few years ago, has played in a number of campaigns in a World Cup. Mm -hmm. Catherine Dane's been around a good few years there and the same with Hannah O'Connor. So it, like that's a very well established squad or leadership group there to, to kind of be that link between player and management but I do think it's strange you don't have a vice captain. It tells me that Nicola Friday is probably going to play 80 minutes of all the games yeah. if possible. But if she doesn't, kind of what happens then? Yeah. What if none of those other leadership players are on the group on the on the pitch? Like who steps up as a vice captain? What if Nicola Friday, Touchwood, picks up an injury? Like and you don't have that kind of ready-made vice captain. But look, that's Greg putting his mark on on his squad and saying. We don't need to have a vice captain. We have our leadership group. We have other leaders within the squad that haven't been named. And, you know, like th that's just the way he wants to go about it. And it is him just putting his, his mark on his squad. Yeah, and a new choice probably for a new squad. It is, and it's a new era. It, it is a huge time of change. Um, you know, there's been a lot of background noise and stuff like that coming into the Six Nations. And I think the girls are just hoping, I'd say they just can't wait for Saturday to get going, leave the World Cup campaign behind them, you know, build on the November internationals that they had and, and kick off into this new era. Mm -hmm. And we actually have a clip of Nicola Friday um, just the day after she was announced as captain in the IRFU. 
like we've had a great few weeks of camps and um, it's been really exciting we're we're learning to implement Greg's system and it's been just a really good buzz and um, we've been doing some culture kind of exercises so we've been taking Irish classes we've been <laughs> we went out to Avonry and Blessington so like we're big with Covid like res like restrictions easing we've been able to bring that kind of crack element back into it and it's and it's just been a really enjoyable environment to be in and then on the pitch like that transpires because you're just happy to be here and you're happy to be playing rugby and you're happy to be together so it's been a really exciting few weeks mm -hmm. and how do you think you're set for Saturday yeah we're really excited look we've had really good camps and we've had a few practice matches and stuff like that so and the system and shape that we're looking to implement I think it's going to be a really exciting system for us and girls getting to express themselves on the pitch so it's going to be a really good match and we're, we're so excited to be back in front of a crowd again for a Six Nations match since 2020. That was the last match that we had so in front of a crowd. So it's just really, it's really exciting to get back to the RDS now. And you've obviously lost a lot of senior players, especially for yourself in the pack, Keira Griffin, Kleena Maloney, even Lindsay Peach. Who do you expect to sort of step up and fill those roles now? Like, I think we may have like lost kind of experience in caps but there's a lot of girls that have been in this system for the last four or five years so they know what it takes to be an international player so they'll get their opportunities now to stand up on the pitch and show what they can do so like there's still that core group of girls there and then the new caps have brought in this new exciting kind of element to the team as well so I think we'll see a lot of girls getting kind of just to stand up and show what they can do in this tournament. So I think there's a lot to kind of, she said a lot there, a lot to unpack. So first of all, I suppose in that main pack in the whole team, as we've mentioned earlier, there's a lot of key players missing. You've Kleena Maloney, you've Lindsay P having retired, Kira Griffin. How do you think that's going to change the team? Well, just like Nicola said, look, they are losses. You know, we knew Lindsay Pete had to retire at some point, you know. <laughs> she has been going for years and she's been a great servant, but we knew she had to retire. And to be honest, like with Kira Griffin retiring too, that's Claire Malloy as well. Like Claire Malloy, well, yeah. like that's not to be, like that wasn't unexpected or surprising in my eyes because you know a lot of these players had been building towards this World Cup. You know that was meant to be last year, and a lot of them stayed on and um, for the extra year or whatever it was to try and qualify. And a lot of them had plans that they were going to retire after that World Cup anyway. To be honest, I'm actually quite surprised that we haven't seen more retirements from that. But I'm guessing what that came from is that a lot of players didn't want to go out on that low in their career and they wanted another campaign to be able to kind of show that they're a better team than that, better players than that, and kind of leave it on a high. But yeah, look, Greg has definitely... Um, you know, shown how he wants things to be done, leaving out a certain amount of players. And there was a discussion, you know, was it form based or was it for other reasons? And and he's he's been open and honest about it, which is really nice to see and that it's just based on selection. And he's left the door open there for a number of those players. I do think Kleena Maloney's omission is a glaring one. You know, we we haven't had massive depth in the front row, let alone Hooker, for a number of years. And not only is she our best line out thrower, but she's simply brilliant in the loose and gives us that physicality that we kind of lack at times, you know. Um, so do you think she would have been surprised to not be included? Yeah, I would say so. Um, absolutely. You know, she's a hugely competitive player. Um, you know, she's been involved, I think, in every campaign for Ireland um, over the last number of years, played in every game that she's been available. Um, you know, and definitely that would have maybe taken her by surprise. But there's, as I said, Greg's left the door open. There's an opportunity for her to come back. She's playing with Wasps over in England and, you know, at a very high standard there. And hopefully, you know, she's able to play her way back into form. But for me, I there's a huge opportunity there at Hooker for um, the likes of Emma Hoob and Neve Jones. Um, Claire Bowles, I hear, is being tried out in that position. You know, two of those three are going to be in this weekend squad and they have to step up and start owning that jersey but set piece has always been massive for us so the line out in particular is going to be an area that we really need to focus on and I hope that you know one of these girls can can do a job for us there. And it's interesting what you're saying there as in like these girls Lindsay P obviously people have to retire at some point do you nearly think the lack of players that are kind of like older or have more caps is a problem that like 
should have been started to be addressed maybe five years ago, maybe build up experience rather than just being left with this like glaring gap now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do think that we should have had a lot more development over the last number of years. Now, granted, COVID did have a huge impact on that because there are underage um, provincial teams there and underage sevens team going there. And that's usually where we figure out where the best talent is from. And then you look at schools rugby that's kind of been improving over the last number of years. That all has been affected. And so it has been, we have seen this kind of lull or gap in rugby. Like even senior women's rugby in, in Ireland the last number of years was cancelled and we never got to see a lot of players play. So yeah, but I, I do wish, um, it, it's really pleasing to see the, there will be an under 18s, um, Six Nations this year for um, the under 18 girls team because we'll start to see that bit of development on an international stage. And so that when we do, find players who are excellent and um, you know hopefully we find a few more Bave and Parsons and all that quite young we're not trying to bring them into senior international rugby without having played to any sort of a, like that kind of standard ever before so I'm glad to see it now but we're yeah I, I wish it happened a couple of years ago because I, I do think we'd have a much stronger squad in terms of the players we have now but also the depth coming through. So maybe then that's sort of what Greg McWilliams has spotted and is like building towards now, would you say? Yeah, absolutely. And they also have earmarked like a little development team as well that has come by. So there's the under 18s um, women's Six Nations that we're going to have. And then there seems to be like a little development group that they've earmarked for these younger players who aren't quite ready for senior international rugby, but that they're going to kind of focus on certain areas for them so that hopefully they can transition into that senior team. And it is, it's really positive to see. These are the moves that we would have liked to see a few years ago, but better late than never. And Nicola also touched there on, obviously, they're heading in as amateur players to a professional team. The last time you would have met them, they, were, they weren't professional. Do you think they will have changed the way they play rugby now? Yeah, look, I don't know. Um, last year, Wales wouldn't have been very happy with their Six Nations campaign, and they shipped a heavy defeat to us in, in the very first campaign. And that, that was a really nice confidence booster for us, and I'm sure it was devastating for them in terms of their morale. But... As you say, they have a whole new setup come in, a whole new group of coaches. They have a lot of ex-Welsh players in there who kind of are able to draw on their experiences and help them through. They have a really good blend of youth and experience within their squad. I think they have six new caps in their squad. Um, and they got their, their contracts in, I think it was around November. And so they've had a couple of months now to adjust to that new life. They are one of the teams heading to the World Cup this year and they didn't have the pressure that, uh, the likes of Italy, Scotland and Ireland had over the last year about um, having to qualify because they qualified at the last World Cup. So they've been able to just focus on the Six Nations and taking it week by week and game by game um, without having to focus on qualifiers. And I do think it'll be a different team that we uh, will meet and they have some electric players, the likes of Jazz Joyce and Ellie Snowsell uh, will be steering the ship from 10 or 12 and they will be a challenge, but I would be hoping that Ireland has a little bit too much firepower for them because I can't see exponential growth uh, enough to, to beat the talent that we have if we play to our potential. And do you think there, Nicola, saying, I think she said, you know, everything they do on and off the pitch, it's professional, it's the same. At the end of the day, professionalism is about like money, giving your players time to recover without having to, you know, go out and work or do other things. Do you think... It's a, sort of something she, well, she obviously has to say it, but do you think it will really make that much of a difference? Look, it does, and it does, like, I haven't been in that squad. Like, you do, when you're in camp and that's your sole focus there, you know, they are giving 100%. They are putting in those little one percenters, making sure their recovery is right, making sure they're fueled, making sure new nutrition is good and sleep is good and all that. You know, and they are, like, professionals when they're in that environment. But the problem is not when they're in the environment, it's when they go home. Yeah. So the girls all finished their camp. They, they went into camp Friday afternoon. They had, I think, five or six sessions over the weekend. They stay overnight in a hotel and get their meetings and whatever else done. Um, and then they go home on a Sunday afternoon. Now, that Sunday afternoon for me was great because I lived in Dublin, so I had a 20 minute trip down home. Mm -hmm. For Kira Griffin last year, she was trekking home to Kerry, which was what, three and a half, four hour drive on top of training all weekend to go home and get ready to go to school or to go to work the next morning that's where the the professionalism changes she still would you know get her gym session done in the week and make sure her food prep and all that was gone 
but she you know is much more tired having to get up early for work the next day you know having to plan all this out then having to go training that evening that's the differences that we're seeing or we're going to see between the likes of England and Scotland Wales and, and ourselves is that for most of them after training all weekend they don't have to get up on a Monday morning and do a full day's work and then maybe get a recovery swim in. Yeah. They can go for they can take a lie in, go for a coffee, then take their swim, and maybe they might be working part time or whatever for a few hours. So it will make a difference. So I fully agree that they are trying to be as professional as possible on the pitch and everything else. It's what they do off the pitch. And life gets in the way sometimes, you know? Sometimes you stay up and you watch that extra Netflix or so when you shouldn't, and then you only have six hours sleep. Yeah. Whereas if you do that as a professional or in your whale squad, it's all right because you just sleep in an extra hour later the next morning. Mm -hmm. The girls don't have that opportunity and it's the really dedicated ones and the ones who can manage and to be organized like that that come out on top. And I think we have a clip. It's obviously not Greg McWilliams' decision. He doesn't have any stay in, say in it, and he's probably just working with what he has. But we have a clip now of Greg McWilliams' thoughts on it as well. And do you think the Wales team will have changed significantly since the last time we would have met them and we bet them 45 nil, and now they obviously <laughs> have their yeah. professional contracts in there? Look, I mean, professionalism is an attitude. You know, like uh, for me, professionalism is Monday morning when it's dark and, and nobody's watching it, how you get out of bed and how you go about your business and how you make choices. It's not about money you get paid. Um, in saying that, you know, Wales have qualified for the Rugby World Cup, as have all the Six Nations team, and we're the only one who hasn't. So with that in mind, this is a good chance for us to establish our pillars as a group. Uh, so when the World Cup is finished and there's a good transition with other teams, that we'll be quite connected and quite cohesive, and that's when we'll kick on. I think, I think this is a really important year for us to establish our DNA as a group and what means uh, a lot to us. Uh, you know, we have a, we have Gaelic every week at the moment. We have an Irish teacher coming in teaching the girls Irish. That's really important to me. Uh, we have family at the forefront of everything that we're doing. That's important to me, and we've got just an incredible group of players that are inspirational and my goal is that by their body language and by how they act regardless of where they win or lose that there's people looking from the stands or looking from home and they're inspired by what they see that's all I ask for and as long as we have that attitude I'll always be a proud coach. So what do you make of that? I, I like what he's saying like and he is right in terms of the amateur versus professionalism side of things it is all about the choices that you make off the pitch the and the mindset that you're in and kind of what you do to prepare yourself to be the best rugby player that you can be. There is nothing that these girls in the Irish team can do about coming up and facing, you know, professional players. At the end of the day, it is 15 on 15, 80 minutes in. The difference is after, you know, four or five, four games in and we're heading to the last weekend of um, the championship, you know, Will they lag a little bit behind in the rest because they're not as well rested and they've had working weeks in behind that? Who knows? But again, it is up to choices, up to the choices that they make. And like, there's nothing the girls can do. They're not professional. They're professional in everything they do, but they're not professional at the end of the day. But they just got to get on with it. And they very happily are getting on with it. And I do like that. What's interesting about what Greg said there is I love that he's not just focusing on the rugby. Mm -hmm. He's really trying to kind of adopt and identify yeah, with a the, culture. The Irish yeah, the culture. and it's really nice to see because again, we have players coming from all around the country with very different backgrounds. You know, very different starting points in rugby. You have some who picked up rugby later in life. You have some who've been playing it their whole life. And mm -hmm. um, you know, some coming from other sports. Some who who come from a Gael talk background and have a lot of Irish and are fluent, and some who know very little Irish, particularly those maybe coming from. Um, IQ like an exiles over in England and, and they qualify through you know their parents being Irish whatever they might not have a lot of Irish or anything like that same with some of the girls coming up from Ulster some of them might not have a lot of Irish so I really like that idea of creating that culture um, and what he said about them being bonded post World Cup because he's right every other team there probably has players who are hanging on and I say hanging on some of them are hanging on very well but that are planning to retire after the World Cup. Yeah. You know, whereas Ireland, do we have that? I don't know. We might still have a couple of retirements, but we are more so looking to the future, whereas most teams in this competition are looking to September, October for the World Cup. Mm -hmm. And he's saying that they'll be in a much more, um, or a position of strength 
by that time when other teams are starting to rebuild and he nearly has a year's head start on them. So it, it's an interesting focus, um, but one I suppose he has to take because he doesn't have that target of the World Cup. Mm -hmm. But I, I like what he's saying there. It seems very positive and, you know, as I said, results don't massively matter in this campaign because we're building, mm -hmm. but we also would like a couple of positive results to be able to build on. Yeah, it's sense. probably something we'll just see in time. So in time, you can look back in three years and say that was a good move on yeah, his exactly. like part there. And as a player, if you were in camp, you know, doing <laughs> Irish classes and all this, what do you think you'd make of it? Do you know what? I, th I do like it. It's a very welcome distraction. You know, there's only so much you could put in on the pitch without flogging players. And particularly, like say, the weekend just gone, you have to be very careful about how many pitch sessions you've done or how many meters you've covered because you want them to be rested leading in. Again, with the mindset that a lot of them are going to go work for the week or for a couple of days and don't have the luxury of easing into this week and whatever else. But I, I do like it. I like that there is a lot of downtime between sessions and um, in the days, particularly when you're in a hotel and there's... I'm not sure about the girls if they're still in a bit of a COVID bubble just to be careful because again if you pick up COVID unfortunately you'll be ruled out of a game or two and, and that's obviously not what you want so I think they are being very cautious in how they do things so there is a lot of time to kill so I like the idea of you know getting Irish language lessons in there you know doing different things they were down at some um, bonding weekend yeah, uh, last weekend. Bonding seems to kind of be the main focus, like gelling the team together. Yeah, but there, like, there is a lot of um, new players in there. You know, there's a lot of young players. Uh, some of them, their first time in a um, an Irish camp, haven't been uncapped. Others being back after first time, and there's a lot of players who might. Oh, I, I've heard of you know Nicole Cronin, but I've never played with her, and I don't really know who she is as a, as a person, what she's like off the pitch, but also I don't really know what she or how she likes to play on the pitch, you know? So you do have to, there is that certain element of bonding and getting to know your players and getting to know your teammates. So, <coughs> excuse me, you know how they work on and off the pitch. So I, I like it, but you know, that's happening in every squad. You know, Ireland aren't unique in that, but it is nice to see the approach that, that Greg has taken. We, we never did Irish language lessons. Um, you know, in, in my years in there, I wish we had, I wish my, my Irish was a little better, but you know, we'll see, we'll see how, how they go over the next few weeks. Again, it's hard from our point of view, because this is a new era, they haven't played yet, we don't know what to expect. Next year we'll have a much better idea about where the team is actually at and where we can go from there. Mm -hmm. And then looking forward to this Saturday, obviously the big question will be who's lining out the squad itself, there's new people in there. Who who are you expecting to see? Oh, God, I don't know. Um, I do think there'll be a couple of changes. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, there well, there has to be a couple of changes because you won't have mainstays and stalwarts like um, Sene Naupu there or, or Kleena Maloney. So you're definitely seeing changes there. Lindsay Peach having retired. Uh, Laura Feely, the, the, another prop is out with injury. So I do think we're going to see a much changed front row. Um, obviously, second row, I think Sam Monaghan might get the nod to um, to partner Nicola Friday there, although I do know that Dorothy Wall has been uh, kind of having a look to see, can she jump between second row and back row? And back row is an area of huge competition, and I can see maybe why they're trying to do that. They're trying to get all their best players on the pitch. You know, I'm, I'm thinking, or what I, again... I, Look, I'm not a coach. I wouldn't. I wouldn't like to be in the position to have to pick, but maybe Dorothy Wall at six, May Vogel Leary at seven, and Hannah O'Connor at eight. Mm -hmm. uh, for a bit of experience, Catherine Dane at nine. Although I know Avian Riley has been pushing hard there, and um, you know Elsa Hughes has been around a long time, and she's very experienced as well. Ten is the interesting question. Yeah. It it is the one problem area. Ten kind of has a, like a lot, they make all the decisions, a lot of them in, on the pitch as well, along with nine. Like. Yeah, absolutely. But like they're the playmaker, they control it. Along with the, the nine, they are the playmakers. They decide whether we're kicking, whether we're running, can they see the space, you know, um, can they figure out the line speed that's happening? And that all has to be done fairly quickly. And, you know, having been a 10 myself, I, re I know that is a pressure situation to be in. And different teams played in different ways and defend in different ways and you need to be able to acknowledge that and play around that to your strengths. Mm -hmm. For me, I actually can't call who's going to be a 10, so my the options for me would be Nikki Coy, Nicole Cronin, but 
both having been in Irish camps before, Nicole Cronin more primarily as a nine, mm -hmm. but played 10 with Munster this year. So has, has a bit of experience there and has a lot of uh, experience in general about being in Ireland camps and, how, and, and has a lot of international caps herself. Um, so that'll be an interesting call. And one, I, I really don't know where Greg's head is at with that. And do you think for the likes of Nicole Cronin, she's obviously been out of the team for a while. If she was to come in, say, starting, do you think that will like ruffle a few feathers? Like the, like you have Flood in there, Stacey Flood as well. Or do you think it's kind of like they would have seen these girls play and they know, they know they're well able? I know. Nicole Cronin's a great character to have in the squad. You know, um, she is a menace both on and off the pitch in, in the best way possible and um, I do think there's a place for Stacey Flood in the squad I think the centres could be uh, the position for her to kind of get us to move the ball a little bit more and no I don't think so but sometimes you know having new players come in is not a bad thing some people need their feathers ruffled you know you the last thing you want is a bit of complacency in in a squad and like look I'm not saying that the squad He's has certainly that. not doing that do you know that absolutely not but like you don't want players there sitting pretty thinking that they have that jersey for the next five games no matter what happens. You want that competition because it only drives each and every individual to be better. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you have uh, Nicole Cronin, Nikki Cahey, Stacey Flood battling out for the 10 jersey, they're all going to be giving it 100%, 110% in training each time, trying to be better than they were the last time to ensure they get a jersey. Mm -hmm. And then that just drives other players on. And if you have that happening in every single position, the team can only get better. You know, it's lack of competition that, that kind of gets a, a squad stalling a little bit and gets a team stalling. But I think it's great to see we'll have a load of new players. I think we'll see Stacey Flood in the centres. You know, uh, our back line, I think, will be littered with some of these sevens players. And I, I nearly hate calling them sevens players. Like, they are sevens players, but they're fifteens players too. And they've been integrated into that squad for a good few seasons now. It's, you know, and they've been in camps and they're great additions. You know, you have the, the two exceptional players of Baven Parsons and, and Amy Lee murphy Crow, who I assume w will play on the wing. But they can only be devastating if we move the ball. And we have um, Molly Scruffle McCabe. She had a great game there with Railway along with Eve Higgins. Do you think she'll maybe get a look in? I don't know. Like Molly's been around a good few years. She was she was on the seven squad uh, a number of years ago when she was quite young. Um, the, the big thing about Molly is she's very versatile and she's not afraid to, to step up you know, on the big days. And as I said, she played in that uh, AAL Cup final for Railway and she was excellent. Yeah, she played her and full Eve Higgins day. kind of partnership. Yeah, and she played full back that day, but she primarily would have played as a nine for most of the season. Um, I don't know, again, I haven't heard how she's been going in camp, but like I'm sure she's certainly putting her hand up there. I wonder, are they looking at her more as a fullback than as a nine? Because we have quite a few options at nine already. Um, but it could be an interesting, well, look, she could sneak her way onto the bench because of her versatility. Yeah. You know, it's, it's always nice. I'm sure she could play 10 a little bit if, if needed in an emergency, so. That, they're the kind of players you want on the bench, the, the Ian Madigans who can play all across the back line, you know. So I don't know. She's still, she's still young enough that she's plenty of time. Again, this is her first time in a 15s camp. So it depends. Has she done And to if she doesn't Greg? get a look in at all, do you think it'd be a shame for her? Or is she, she's still obviously young, so. Not so much a shame because I think players even who don't get a look in, uh, in terms of game time, still have went through eight to ten weeks of huge experience and growth that they maybe wouldn't have gotten if they weren't in the squad at all. And so they still come out the other side better players, knowing how the game works. They're always given, um, I suppose, pointers on where they can improve to try and get a jersey. So, like, for example, if Molly was to um, not get a chance in this year's Six Nations, you know, she'll have been told she needs to go off and work on this, this and this. Mm -hmm. She'll get to play loads with club and then hopefully be given another opportunity. But there are unfortunately players in that uh, wider squad that will not get played in the Six Nations this year because there's only 23 jerseys up for grabs, you know. And in some ways you want some sort of consistency there while also building depth. But um, it's about the last few weeks of training. Who has stepped up and who has, you know, learned how Greg wants his defence to work, how his attack wants to work, who has learned about the tactics and the way they're going to play and who has kind of gotten that culture and that identity in and, and manifested and been able to put in a performance. Mm -hmm.
And I think obviously it's all to be revealed for Saturday, but for the game itself, what are your predictions for it? You know, I'm going to go for an Ireland win, um, partly based off of their how we beat them so well last year. And I know this is a transitional squad and a new squad and a lot has changed with Wales, but I still think that we have far too much power, um, you know, for this Welsh squad. If, if, if you had to give it a score, what would you put on it? Um, I'm hoping the girls are listening to this so they can score a few tries, but probably 29-10. You know, I'd obviously love for Ireland to keep that to a shutout and keep that to nil, but Wales have some, some excellent players um, you know, and over the course of a game, mistakes do happen and we're not expecting a perfect performance the weekend. But I think 29-10 is a, is a realistic and achievable scoreline to get and I think the girls would be pretty happy if they were to come out with a 29-10 win you know, and have not moved the ball and, and put in a good performance. At the end of the day... The perform I, I, this sounds so cliche, but like the performance is what matters the most. If they were to go out there and lose 25 4 but put in a really good performance, I think Greg would be in some ways happy with that. Mm -hmm. You know, and the girls wouldn't be, but when they look back, there haven't been too many good performances by an Irish team over 80 minutes in the last number of years. So it would be a really nice thing to go out with a win and put in a good performance. Mm -hmm. And then we have France and Italy as well, obviously. What's your score predictions for that? Yeah, look, I think France will be runaway winners in that. Italy are much improved over the last number of years. They showed that in the, the World Cup qualifying tournament by winning it outright. But um, Do you think it's going to be a slaughter? Yes and no. I do think France will put about 50 points on them. Mm -hmm. But I think Italy will score maybe 10, 15 points. They always manage to sneak in for a try here mm -hmm. and there, no matter who they're playing. So, yeah, it'll probably be something like 53, 15. Again, I do think it'll be a kind of a heavier defeat. Um, England, obviously, are an exceptional team. And I'm really looking forward to the very last week of the Six Nations where we'll see England and France pitting it out for what probably will be the title. Mm -hmm. um, but I think England run away with this. Scotland are really upcoming sides. You know, they're coming off the back of qualifying for the World Cup for the first time. And they'd be full of confidence. They've had a couple of weeks head start and everybody else because of that uh, qualifying tournament. But I do think that England have a little bit too much firepower. And so I'm going to probably say 47-12. 47-12, perfect. So just a quick reminder to anyone listening that you're listening to the Her Sports Six Nations show brought to you in association with Opal, the exclusive car partner to the IRFU. So we mentioned it there as well. Ireland are obviously the only team in the Six Nations not to qualify for the World Cup. Do you think that makes a difference or is it just kind of, you know, what, what happens? Look, looking at it from the outside, yes, it doesn't look great. Mm -hmm. But again, the girls know there's nothing they can do about that. If you continue to dwell on the past and keep thinking about it, going into this campaign, oh, we haven't qualified for the Six Nations or for the World Cup and we're the only team that hasn't, that's not going to get them anywhere. Mm -hmm. There's nothing they can do about that. And that's why I think this campaign is so important. Having this new era, this new uh, coaching staff, uh, Greg's new whole idea on how he wants to run things because mm -hmm. they have to start afresh. Yeah. You know, they keep thinking about the past and what they failed to do. They're never going to be able to advance forward and improve. And so... I, don't, I think the players will have forgotten about it. Like They will just be going into this, taking it one game at a time, hoping again to put in performances, you know, get the results if they come and learn from any mistakes that they do make, which, which will inevitably happen. Um, so no, I think the, the World Cup is, is gone in the back of their minds. Um, you know, there is maybe a little bit of hurt still there that they will use to kind of drive them on to improve so that they don't feel like that again. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's shadowing them or you know going to be influential for, for the Six Nations. And in terms of the other teams going in into the games, knowing they have a World Cup coming up, will that make a difference in what players they play or what um, do you think? Well, for the, like the players themselves, they're all, they know that there's not too many games that they'll have to make their mark to make sure they get in that World Cup squad. Yeah. So like every minute they get in the pitch, they need to take as an opportunity and not just on the pitch, but like whatever they do off the pitch. And 
for them sometimes it can be nearly more difficult the closer it gets to a world cup because you're thinking just don't get injured just don't get injured and i'll make the squad and um, but they'll just be looking to put in a performance um each time to keep a jersey keep going put a bit of, put a bit of credit in the bank for them so that come world cup selection time they are a must to be included um, you know, and that's what the Irish girls have to be wary of, that every player that they're going out to play against is fighting for a jersey in the World Cup or a spot in the World Cup and that they will go for 80 minutes and it'll be tough. Like, you know, I remember for me trying to get a spot in the 2017 World Cup squad, every session was like fraught with nerves and anxiety and like, have I done enough? Oh God, I dropped a ball there. Is that going to be the ball that you know cost my place in the squad and I was always trying to improve always trying to make everything I did make sure that that was going to help me get to the World Cup and, and that's what they're up against and it'll be a challenge but one that I'm sure the Irish girls are relishing how good will it feel for them to hopefully defeat a couple of these teams in the Six Nations and be like you're going to the World Cup but we just beat you and we're not kind of proving to themselves we were good enough we just didn't perform Mm -hmm. And with, so we have the other teams fighting for their possessions to make their mark. Then with our team, we have, as we were saying, like the girls we think will be starting. And then suddenly in the middle of it all, there's obviously a seven series. So what do you make of that? Obviously, sevens are contracted players. They really will have to go play. It's a World Cup year for them next year. What yeah. difference is that going to make? It's going to be a huge blow to the team. Look, this is not a new problem that we faced over the last number of years. Um, I've been a player in their position where I was contracted with sevens and also been involved in the 15 squad. And, you know, there were a couple of years ago, maybe wasn't dealt with so well, but they have, as I said, integrated both players or players into both squads and done it really well. But at the end of the day, they are sevens contracted players. There is a World Series in Langford in Canada um, in round four, I think it is, of the Six Nations. And so... I fully expect that a lot of those sevens players, if they are fit and healthy, so the likes of Stacey Flood, Lucy Mulhall, the captain of sevens, Amy Lee Murphy Crow, Bavin Parsons, um, Anna McGann in there, like I fully expect the majority of those to travel to Canada and not be available for um, Ireland's game against England in round four. But this has happened before, and as Greg mentioned, there are opportunities for other players to step up. You know, so you might be one of those players who's not making the 23 for the first couple of rounds, but training really well and just missing out, you're going to get an opportunity to stake your claim for a jersey for the last two rounds. Mm -hmm. And in a year where we don't have um, a World Cup to look forward to in 15s... People like, need all the game time. And people need, need all the game time it. they can get. You know, there is a Sevens World Cup on this year. Uh, they are contracted. They've been doing really well on the World Series. You know, and I can't see, they got a silver in Seville in um, February, I think it was. And like, I can't see them going off to Langford the very next tournament and bringing a squad without their captain and without some of their most experienced players and most devastating players. So it's part and parcel of, of women's rugby. We don't have that same um, challenge, I suppose, in the men's side of things, but it is what it is. You know, the players themselves and the girls themselves know the situation and they'll know that weeks beforehand coming into it that there's a chance that they'll go off to Canada and that somebody else will take that opportunity. And if they come back and they're available for the last round, they're going to have to fight for it. You know, just because they had a jersey before they left doesn't mean they'll have a jersey when they come back. Mm -hmm. But that's that's rugby and that's that's sport. you got to fight for what it is. And in Ireland and women's rugby, 15s and 7s have been linked the last number of years and we need to try and make it so that it works out the best for both squads because we don't want one to suffer at the hands of the other. Mm -hmm. And at the press conference, IRFU coach Greg McWilliams was asked if he was given assurances that he would have a full squad to pick from. Obviously, we kind of know he wouldn't, but we can, we'll see now what he had to say about it. Yeah, I was given those assurances, but I'm being true to myself and this is a World Cup sevens year. Um, and look, the Sevens players are incredibly professional. They're, they've been coached brilliantly and they're going to be important to us, but we need to build depth as well within the squad. So for me, we've talked as a group about this. Uh, we allowed the players to um, have a say in, 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 in how selection is carried out. We're all very comfortable with that, um, that we have the Sevens team. I think it's important that, that as many as possible go to Langford and represent uh, the women for the World Series because it's a World Cup year for the Sevens. Because I'm telling you now that we're going to have a World Cup year for 15s and we need to play, play ball with them. We need to work together. 
and you know Aidan McNulty who's the the sevens coach uh, you know we see the game very similarly um, and we're very much aligned the players are very clear and it's a good chance for us for the last few games and Italy and France to look at as many players as we can as we build our squad um, and as I keep saying we've got to keep learning keep getting better and um, the more people that we can see during the Six Nations the better so I'm really happy that uh, we have the sevens players as you call them um, for the pre-season that we've had, our pre-camps, and, and for, for the number of games that we have. But once they cross once they cross the line coming in here, they're 15s players, and, and they're excited about being part of this group, and uh, we're excited to have them. And it's interesting. He says there at the start of the clip that players have a say in selection, or they will. Is that true? Um, I don't know. Maybe the situation has changed. Um, I I love I love his honesty and how he kind of said oh I was assured you know I would have them all but being true to myself he's basically saying he doesn't think he will yeah. but like I I really like his honesty and as he said the players know going into this both those who are only 15s and those who are 15s and 7s that this is something that will happen um do players have a choice I I'm not sure <laughs> like I'm not sure at the end of the day they are contracted to sevens, they get uh, they're on that like they they are on a a wage per se or a bursary, um, because it's an Olympic sport and we are trying to improve that game and we don't want one like fifteens to be at the detriment of sevens or sevens to be at the detriment of fifteens. So I, I don't know, maybe something has changed. In my day, did you have a say? No, but again, I did have a say to sign a sevens contract. So in some ways, I I did. And why do you think, especially in that back line, they're all sevens players, is there something missing then from, you know, the 15 setup? I remember talking to one of the players before and they said there's contention about including sevens players, but at the end of the day, she, she said to me, Amy Lee Murphy Crow, one of the fastest people in Ireland, like fastest women, like why wouldn't you include her? So why do you think there's that distinction between the 15s and sevens players? It's more so that, um, for, well, for me anyway, like when I joined rugby, I was scouted by the Irish seven squad first. So I was scouted from playing GAA and rugby and I was invited into the seven squad. And then from there, I got my 15s opportunity. And it's the same with some of these girls who are on both sevens and 15 squad. It seems to be that a lot of the talent, uh, particularly backline players, um, they tend to be scouted into the seven setup first um, before they are maybe are caught by the eye of those who are in the 15 setup and so therefore when they do recognize oh wow we have an excellent pair take someone like eve higgins mm -hmm. who you know was scouted from a very young age to be an excellent rugby player and has turned out to be she was in our seven setup when she was still in school just training and kind of getting to the whole idea of it whereas 15s again it's weekend camps and they're not together as much as the sevens players are so they don't have that opportunity of getting those players first and that's where you see the they're, they're labelled as sevens players and then they come into the 15 side of things. But you're right about that. Like, Amy Lee Murphy Crow only got her first cap last year. Mm -hmm. and she's been an incredible player. She scored 100 tries in the seven scene. She's been around there since she's about 17 yeah. or 16. And she only got her 15th chance just recently. Like, how did we not have her in there before? Because she's, she's an unbelievable player. And like, could you imagine someone like Baven Parsons, who again was in our setup? in the sevens um, and in the the 15 set up from a very young age but like could you imagine if we only kept her to one team when she could be so good for both it's just about getting the balance right keeping everybody happy to some degree and making sure that both teams have enough numbers and enough potential enough growth to be able to perform and do you think though there's an issue there that Okay, it's fair to say you go into sevens and fifteens, that's the step up that's there at the moment and it's working at the moment. But then suddenly when these sevens players have to leave, I suppose we'll see it in the campaign, but do you think there should be fifteens that are able to match those sevens players, like the same amount of players? Yeah, absolutely. Look, and I, I, I just want to clarify, I don't think that it's a you go into sevens and then you make the step up to fifteens. They are both senior teams, they are both on a par. You know, there are some players who are in the seven setup who are not suited for 15s and there are some players in the 15 setup who are not suited to sevens and will never make that crossover but they're both senior international teams they're just different forms of the game mm -hmm. you know and um 
there are definitely some 15s player coming through like from a young age who are excellent 15s players and who then have gone over to sevens and have done um you know really well or have been given an opportunity in that regard and I just think that it just depends on who gets to them first or who scouts them first you know like you have someone like Dorothy Wall she's in or she was in I think a um she was in a seven she was in the seven squads and contracted for a number of years but she was always destined to be a super 15s player like she was always going to be phenomenal at 15s and like while she was very good at sevens 15s is her game mm-hmm. you know that sort of way and you'll have players on the other side who um you know may have grown up playing 15s but realized sevens is for me and if you look at it in the men's game and I, I hate comparisons like that but someone like Jordan Conroy superstar in sevens he's you know an unbelievable player he had a Connacht Academy spot with 15s and didn't work out for him because 15s just wasn't for him. Did it make him a less of a player? Absolutely not. He's turned out to be a superstar on the seven side of things. And that is happening on both sides where one form just fits better for a player and, and you end up getting some players, Stacey Flood, Eve Higgins, Babe and Parsons, who can do both. Mm-hmm. I suppose it's just then a matter. I suppose we'll see when the team is released how these players get on and then once again when these players are taken out, who fills their roles. But looking forward to this game on Saturday, home game or DS, what do you think it's going to be like? Yeah, look, I, I really like what the uh, RFU have done this year in, in putting the games on and the home games on in in different places around Ireland. You know, for me, as someone from Dublin, I'm a bit like, oh God, I have to travel. But I think it's great for fans. It's great for growing yeah. the game. And it gives young girls around Ireland the opportunity to see their role models, um, you know, face to face. A lot of people uh, haven't been to a women's rugby game and this is a really good way to grow it. But really looking forward to Saturday. I think the weather is meant to be great, which just helps a lot and makes people happy. It makes more people are going to actually go out there and watch it. But I really hope we get a good crowd. First time playing in the RDS. And, you know, hopefully we get a really good performance. Um, and, yeah, we just go from there. But I am, I'm really looking forward to it. There's a bit of buzz about, um, about it now. And it being a standalone from the men's, there's all focus for the first time on... Um, on this team and as I said it's been in the media we know all what's gone on in the past so there there's an opportunity here to really get something good and positive going for women's rugby in Ireland and it starts with that game on Saturday. And there has been as you were saying a real sort of media campaign that we haven't seen before like everyone seems to kind of know what's happening and obviously the help of that is having that title sponsorship of TikTok what difference does that make for it? Well, that's absolutely huge like you know title sponsor for the first time TikTok Women's Six Nations like and again we're looking at promoting and growing the game and trying to get more and more younger people involved you know in rugby in general not just in women's rugby but just in rugby in general and like TikTok is obviously for young people nowadays and it's it is the social media presence at the minute so to have that title sponsor to have all that social media presence from there you know they've rebranded everything else it looks great it makes people want to go onto their page and have a look about what's going on and it's, it's kind fantastic. of hitting that grassroots a bit more. Absolutely, like, and it's drawn people in, and they're kind of going, "What's this? What's on the weekend?" I thought the I thought the Six Nations was over, and they're being dragged back in. You're now getting people, um, to the point where they're going, "Oh, I don't have to choose between going to the men's match or watching the men's match, and then watching the women's match because they're at separate times." So that's a whole other side of things that we're going to see. People who wanted to go to both but physically couldn't because of the time differences or the. Um, you know different areas that it's being played in now it's standalone I think we're going to see a huge new market being brought in and, and I just think it's going to be excellent and I really hope the girls can grasp this opportunity put in some good performances and and we go from there and, and really help you know women's rugby in Ireland explode this year but we need performances no mm-hmm. pressure girls <laughs> but you know to help drive that mm-hmm. you know everyone wants to jump on the winning train Mm -hmm. And it obviously starts from this Saturday then, that momentum, it's been building. But in a few weeks when we're looking back on the campaign, what what needs to happen for you to look back and be like, yes, that Six Nations went good, not just for Ireland in general, but overall? Yeah, well, what I hope to see is really, really good competitive matches Mm -hmm. in every match. Now, do I think we'll see that? Absolutely not, because I think England and France are going to run away with this. Um, I can't quite call two, or which one, but... 
for from Ireland's perspective, you know, winning all three home games would be an excellent Six Nations campaign. Like it really, really would be, you know, and I hope that they put in a performance against England and France and could come out with their heads held high in that. But winning the three home games for them would be a really, really significant positive step for women's rugby in Ireland. And, um, you know, and going from there. If they don't win all three, if they win a couple and put in a good performance in the rest, that's pretty good too. Look, we're not looking for perfection here. Nobody is expecting Ireland to go out and win a Grand Slam, you know. And again, we don't want to set our sights too high and, and then lambast them for not reaching that. Yeah. But I do think if they got three home wins, it would be massive. I'm not saying it's going to be the be-all and end-all and if they don't, that it's a failure. But from there, outside of that, competitiveness you know I'd love to see some great tries where clips end up going viral because of the offload or because of the finish or because of the skill that's on show because there's huge talent out there and um, you know and most people just haven't watched enough women's rugby to realize that so here's the opportunity and I'm hoping in in whatever it is six or seven weeks I mean it's like that was a brilliant campaign mm -hmm. not just for Ireland for everybody Feels great. Can't wait till we have the next few games going. World Cup's going to be brilliant and everybody's just buzzed about it. Mm -hmm. And maybe we'll have another Bevan Parsons viral viral video. She got a few there in her last Yeah, year. I, I think she's the only one, to be honest. But look, there's huge potential there in that squad. There's uh, a lot of talented players, you know, whether they're inexperienced or experienced, who are able to put on a show and, and have these viral clips for their tackles their finishes their passes their kicks whatever it is and I just hope we get to see that I hope we get to see what these girls can actually do because they are talented we just haven't seen enough of that over the last number of years mm -hmm. so it's about three home wins hopefully all things go into plan some competitive rugby and then seeing players what they can give maybe coming off the bench as well players that wouldn't have had a look in exactly like just Every player grasping their opportunity, showcasing how good women's rugby can be, you know, and turning those skills into performances, you know, and then those performances, hopefully, into wins. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll wrap it up there, turning those performances into wins, hopefully for the Irish side, for us anyway. But thank you all for listening at home. This has been episode one of the Her Sports Six Nations show brought to you in association with Opal, the exclusive car partner to the IRFU. You can catch up on this episode and every episode in the series on YouTube and our social channels or listen to the podcast on every podcast app. And we also have a competition this week. All this week, we're giving you the chance to go support the girls in green as they take on Wales in their opening match of the TikTok Six Nations Championship. You can win two tickets to Ireland's opening fixture at the RDS. And to enter, all you have to do is comment below what you think the final score will be in the Ireland versus Wales match. And a winner will be picked at random. For us here, we have Ireland set to win, but for you at home, we'll have to see who gets it. Yeah. Her Sports Six Nation Show in association with Opal.